Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Ruiz, Dr. Ruiz. I completed my undergraduate work at DePaul University in 2007, graduating from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. I completed my doctoral studies at Lewis University, defending my dissertation in 2017, for which I completed a historiography on the Mexican immigrants of interwar Chicago. In this video, I'm going to share with you five things you should know of Mexican women of Chicago prior to World War II. The Mexican women of Chicago had a unique experience. This experience is different from the Mexican women of the Southern states. Labor recruitment and economic opportunities prompted migration of Mexican families to Chicago, just as immigrant families before them. The large employers at the time were the meatpacking industry, the railroad industry, and the steel mills. Although these employers primarily employed male laborers, women often accompanied the laborers, either as family members or as partners. Thus, Mexican women began to shape their new lives in Chicago. Americanization efforts targeted cultural customs, including the Mexican diet. By changing the eating habits of Mexicans, reformers believed that they would be more successful in their Americanization efforts. The traditional diet of Mexican women and their families blended native food items of Mexico, including corn, beans, squash, chili peppers, rice, flour, and fruit. A blending of Spanish and indigenous food items. By the early 20th century, Americanization efforts targeted Mexican families, specifically Mexican women who were head of the household and or had a major influence on the upbringing of young children. In 1929, reformer Pearl Ellis is quoted as saying, the noon lunch of the Mexican child quite often consists of a folded tortilla with no filling. Such a lunch is not conducive to learnings. The child becomes lazy. In response, the Chicago Standard Budget was created to support Chicago social workers in changing the diets of immigrant groups, including the diets of Mexican families. In examining the proposed diet for Mexican families, it appears that only a few traditional food items remained, placing heavier emphasis on American food items. American food items were introduced at each meal of the day. This included tomato juice for breakfast, eggs and potatoes for lunch, and dried fruit for dinner. The Chicago Board of Education also attempted to assimilate Mexican women. In 1926, the Board of Education promoted free English classes and other coursework such as homemaking. The Board of Education also created a cooking class for Mexican women for which the intention was to interest the girls in home life and in the spirit of real homemaking to give them an insight into the hygiene of the home and of the person, to teach the benefits of sunshine, fresh air, and cleanliness, and to insist on neatness of person and a neat method of work to show the worth of the economy. My research suggests that the Board of Education ultimately sought to impose their ideals onto Mexican women in an effort to shape them into good homemakers to infiltrate American culture and customs into the home where women had a large influence on the children they were raising, for which these children would eventually identify as American citizens. In 1924, Robert Redfield, a well-known professor at the University of Chicago, wrote the following in his field journal. There is really no Mexican in Chicago who is regarded as a leader or with particular prestige. Such a statement is capable of misleading researchers who often turn to Redfield as a leading expert 
during that period. However, my examination of archived papers at the University of Chicago proves otherwise. One notable Mexican female leader was Mrs. Alvarez. In 1924, Alvarez organized the Mexican Women's Club of the University of Chicago Settlement House. Through her leadership, club members purchased second day bread, 75 cents per 100 loaves, which were then resold for three loaves at five cents. The funds raised were then collected by the club treasury. Another club of the University of Chicago Settlement House, which supported Mexican women, was the Mexican Mothers Club. In 1934, Mexican women gathered to study the following topics. Chicago's history, communities, and political organizations. The discussions on these topics occurred in their native language of Spanish as well as English. During their discussions, Mexican women were encouraged to discuss topics of civic questions related to the government, city management, and schooling. Such discussions were important for Mexican women as they shaped a critical point of view of government and city management. Furthermore, opportunities to study political organizations and discuss civic questions supported leadership skills as women were able to create informed opinions on larger systems of their city. The Settlement House Clubs offered various activities, creating a unique space for Mexican and Polish immigrant women to come together. During their gatherings, women were encouraged to share and exchange customs in an amicable community. In 1933, the University of Chicago Settlement House held a class on beauty and culture, during which a mixed group of Mexican and Polish women came together. During this time, they were able to set each other's hair and share in fellowship. During a Christmas party in 1937, Mexican and Polish women played games, sang Christmas carols, and shared Mexican chocolate. According to the University of Chicago Settlement Papers, all groups were noted in catching the spirit of Christmas, even though the two spoke different languages. These findings disrupt the notion that Mexican and Polish immigrant groups did not get along. That narrative is commonly due to the focus and emphasis on male laborers of Chicago. What really brought women together was the commonalities of gender, motherhood, and cultural rituals such as the celebration of Christmas. Finally, the unique experiences of Mexican women of Chicago cannot be lumped together with the experiences of the Mexican women of the Southern states. This includes Texas, Arizona, California. They had a very different experience than the Mexican women of Chicago. For one, the Mexican women of Chicago experienced a longer journey throughout the Midwest prior to settling in Chicago. Whereas the Mexican women of the Southern states lived much closer to the border, perhaps making the commute between Mexico and the United States easier, and perhaps had luck adjusting to a climate more similar to that of their own. The Mexican women of the Southwest typically arrived for seasonal work. They often provided agricultural labor as opposed to the Mexican groups in Chicago, which provided labor for the steel, meatpacking, and railroad industries. In addition, the labor opportunities throughout the Midwest, and more specifically in Chicago, were year-round, whereas the labor opportunities of the Southwest were seasonal. Year-round labor opportunities often prompted long-term settlement in a city like Chicago. 
Mexican women of this time frame are often left out of the narrative or the research focus is on the male laborers of the period of time, while other research that is published and available to the public primarily focuses on the Mexican women of the southern states. My goal is to make sure that the Mexican women of this period, like my great-grandmother, are discovered, examined, and celebrated for their own unique experience and should be shared in the scholarship of this period of time. For more information on this topic, please consider the following. But most importantly, I hope that you learned a few things of the history of Mexican women in our great city of Chicago. Thanks so much.